Whoops, wait a minute. Go back. All right, it is 6.30, so I think what I'll do is we'll just start, we'll get going. Hopefully people will start keep logging on as we go. I let the um, registration open, they can, they can log in for a while. So uh, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our webinar. This is Modern Environmental Politics, Why Voting is Your Superpower. My name is Terry Eichel, and I am with the Interreligious Eco Justice Network. We are a faith based environmental nonprofit. We work with religious communities on environmental issues, but our events and uh, webinars are open to everybody. So um, we're glad that you're here, and we're very excited to have uh, Nathaniel Stinnett here from the Environmental Voter Project to talk about this incredibly important topic. Um, today's webinar. Uh, is obviously sponsored by IREJN, as well as uh, Connecticut Interfaith Power and Light and um, Environmental, Vote, Environmental Voter Project, of course, as well. So uh, Nathaniel is great. He is the founder and executive director of the Environmental Voter Project. He founded the Environmental Voter Project in 2015 af after over a decade of experience as a senior advisor consultant and trainer for political campaigns and issue advocacy nonprofits. Hailed as a visionary by the New York Times and dubbed the voting guru by Grist Magazine, Stinnett is a frequent expert speaker on cutting edge campaign techniques and the behavioral science behind getting people to vote. He has held a variety of senior leadership and campaign manager positions on the US Senate, congressional state and mayoral campaigns, and he sits on the board of advisors for MIT's Environmental Solutions Initiative. Formerly an attorney at the international law firm DLA Piper LLP, Stinnett holds a BA from Yale University and a JD from Boston College Law School. He lives in Boston, Massachusetts with his wife and two daughters. So thank you so much, uh, Nathaniel. We're glad that you are here. And just really briefly before I turn over, our next upcoming uh, webinar is actually going to be Thursday, October 1st in the evening. It will be um, The Impact of a Sustainable Diet, that's a working title, and our speaker will be Dr. Rebecca Beam, who is an economist in the Food and Environmental Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists, so she'll be coming to us from D.C., and uh, I have to say these Zoom webinars are great for getting amazing people like Dr. Beam and, and uh, uh, Mr. Stinnett here with us um, to present on their expertise. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to turn it over. Oh, by the way, so we'll be doing Q&A at the end. So his presentation will be about an hour and then we'll do about half an hour of Q&A. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat function or the Q&A function and I will moderate at the end. Great. Uh, thank you, Terry. And let me just, while well, you're still okay, there here, you go. You got it. let's make sure we can get this to work exactly the way we want it to. Almost. Terry and I had some trouble getting this to, there we go. Oh, How's beautiful. that, Terry? Awesome. I'm gonna... Okay. Uh, so thank you, Terry. Uh, thank you to everybody involved in the, the Interreligious Eco Justice Network. Uh, and thank you for spending some time this evening to learn about our work at the Environmental Voter Project 
and to learn about where modern environmental politics and modern politics in general are these days. Uh, as Terry mentioned, we're going to leave time for a really, really robust and hopefully interesting Q&A session. Uh, so I'm at the most going to present for an hour, uh, possibly a little bit less than that. That being said, believe it or not, some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about, uh, I could talk about for hours and hours and hours. And so if there is something that you think I am giving short shrift to, please forgive me. It's probably by design. I'm probably skimming over something, giving you just enough information about it that if it catches your interest, we can talk about it in more detail during the Q&A session. Uh, so with that in mind, as Terry said, please, if you have any questions as we're going along, put them in the chat box and, uh, and we'll have this great Q&A session afterwards. So let's get started. Uh, as Terry mentioned, I'm Nathaniel Stinnett. I'm the founder and executive director of the Environmental Voter Project. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit, and we do not endorse candidates. We do not lobby for particular environmental policies. Uh, we don't even try to convince people to care more about climate or the environment. Instead, we are solely focused not on changing people's minds, but on changing their behavior. All we do is we identify environmentalists who aren't voting. And then we apply the latest behavioral science to try to nudge them into becoming more consistent voters. And my hope is this evening that I'll, I'll discuss our work with you in three sections. The first is, why do we do this? What is the problem that we're trying to solve? And, and, and why are we taking this particular approach? Second, how do, I, how do we identify these non-voting environmentalists? And then third, how do we then nudge them and change their behavior and turn them into better voters? And my hope is not only will you find this interesting, because I think we do really interesting and impactful work, but even if you end up not being interested in our work per se, you might, I think, learn quite a bit about how modern political campaigns are run because most people don't understand the true depth of data analytics and behavioral science that's used to target and mobilize uh, anybody in any election these days. Uh, and just to be sort of well-informed members of society, I hope this will be really, really interesting and a great learning opportunity for you. All right, so let's jump into things. One of the biggest reasons we cannot enact progressive environmental policy in this country is that voters don't prioritize environmental issues. This is a huge, huge problem. We'll go back in time a little bit. Back in the 2016 presidential election, when you polled likely voters, only 2% listed climate or some other environmental issue as their number one top priority. And then another 2% listed it as their second highest priority. Now, my guess is many of you, like I did, watched the three presidential debates in 2016 and were deeply frustrated that there wasn't a single question about climate change or environmental issues in those three debates. Well, this is why. This is why. When there's no demand for something in a marketplace, it's really hard to justify supplying it. When the Clinton campaign and the Trump campaign and all of the major networks looked at the issues that voters cared most about, this was the data that they saw. This is the data that they saw. And so it's really, really hard to expect anybody, no matter whom we elect, to really lean forward on the issues that we care most about if they're way, way down 13th, 14th, 15th on the list of voter priorities. Now, as you probably know, things have been getting, uh, I don't know if better or worse is the right word, but, but certainly more people care about climate and the environment than they did in 2016. In 2018, for the midterm elections, it was up to 7% listing all environmental issues or, or any environmental issue as their top number one priority. Now, to be clear, this is an apples to oranges comparison. 
People who vote in presidential campaigns are different from people who vote in midterm elections. Far fewer people vote in midterm elections. But still, there's some pretty significant growth going on here from 2% to 7%. Since the 2018 midterm elections, it's gotten even higher. We did some polling at the Environmental Voter Project at the end of last calendar year, so before COVID-19, but the end of last calendar year, that had 12% of likely voters in the upcoming presidential election listing climate or the environment as their number one issue, their number one most important priority. So from 2% in 2016, likely voters in that presidential, to 12% in the tw of likely voters in the 2020 pr presidential. That's huge, huge growth. However, however, we can't pat ourselves on the back because the truth is, even at 12%, that is way, way down the list. And if you are a politician running for office, not just at the national level, but at the state or local level, you aren't going to spend your time and energy talking about something that's fifth or sixth or seventh on voter priorities. You're just not. Moreover, even when we elect the right people, even when we elect champions of environmental leadership and climate leadership, well, it isn't like they can just snap their fingers and get everything that they want. They need to decide what to spend their precious political capital on. And this is something that I saw for over a decade running political campaigns. I only worked for people who were climate champions. But when I was running their election, it would have been malpractice to say, hey, let's talk about this issue that we know nobody cares about. And then once they got elected, it was really, really hard to say, you know what, let's go all in. Let's spend all of our political capital talking about this issue that's number five or number six on voter priorities. I know that might sound like a lack of courage, and it probably is a lack of courage, but we're never, ever going to get politicians to really take the, the difficult stances and to push hard on this set of issues until we increase the number of voters who care deeply about this issue. Now, why is this important? Well, it's particularly important that we increase the number of voters who care about climate and the environment because of this. And if there's only one thing, if there's only one thing that you take away from tonight's discussion, let it be this. You ready? Who you vote for is secret, but whether you vote or not is public record. I'm going to say that again. Whether you vote or not is public record. I and any other political operative and any other nonprofit leader and any politician or policymaker at the local, state, or federal level can grab their laptop and open it up and log into public voter files and see what elections you vote in and what elections you don't vote in. Now, to be clear, no one can ever look up how you vote. That's secret. But whether you voted in last winter's town election, or whether you voted in the 2018 midterm, or whether you voted in the 2016 presidential, that's all public record. And so, if I am running Terry's campaign for governor of Connecticut, well, we only have one goal. We want to get Terry 50% plus one of the vote on a Tuesday in November. And because we know, we literally know, who is likely to vote and who isn't likely to vote in that election because we have years and years of voting histories available to us? Who do you think we're going to target? Are we going to target people who aren't registered to vote? No way. Are we going to target people who are registered but they never bother to show up? No way. Are we going to target people who are registered but only vote in presidential elections? No, Terry's running for governor. We're only going to target the people who have a history of voting in those midterm elections. And that might sound awful, it might sound cynical, but we take it as a given in any other aspect of life. I mean, we, we wouldn't expect Ford Motor Company to market their cars to three-year-olds. Three-year-olds don't drive. Ford only markets their cars to drivers. 
just like politicians really only care about voters, not non-voters. And it's public record who votes and who doesn't vote. We wouldn't expect Starbucks to care about you if you don't drink coffee. They care about coffee drinkers. Well, this means that campaigns, by and large, not always, but by and large, only target likely voters. And when they don't just target likely voters, maybe they only dip down a little bit and get to people who are, are pretty darn likely to vote in the upcoming election. But what they never do, for very good reason, is target people who are unlikely to vote or target people who never vote. And so that polling data that I just showed to you, showing how few voters list climate or the environment as their number one priority, is a problem. It's a big deal because of this. If I'm running Terry's campaign, and we know that we're only going to target people who are likely to vote in the election we care about, who do you think we're going to poll? That's right we're only going to poll those likely voters. If we know that this group of people is going to vote, why should we bother figuring out the priorities of these people over here who are not going to vote? And this is so crucially important to understand. Policymakers at all levels, local, state, and federal, know who vote and who doesn't vote. And so when they do their market research, when they do their polling, they are never, ever going to bother trying to figure out the policy priorities of non-voters. Why on earth should they? They know who's going to show up. Those are the people they need to answer to. Those are the people who are going to decide whether those politicians get to continue making policy or not. And so this is the significant problem that the American climate and environmental movement is facing right now. This polling data I showed to you, and believe me, it hasn't changed much this year. This polling data I'm showing to you, it, it, it's not secret. Anybody can lay down a poll of likely voters for whatever election they have coming up that they care about. And they'll see that the number of actual voters who list climate and the environment as their number one priority is way, way too low to really drive decision making. Okay. I've put out a lot of maybe frustrating information to you. I'm gonna tell you, I promise it's not going to end uh, with you feeling frustrated. I promise that we're gonna to get to the good news. I promise that we're gonna to get to some amazing opportunities. So don't worry about it. Okay, so we have this problem. There are far too few voters who don't list climate or the environment as one of their top priorities. Here's the really interesting thing though. The reason so few voters list climate or the environment as their number one priority is not because too few Americans do. Let me say that again, because it's important. The reason so few voters care about climate or the environment is not because too few Americans do. In fact, there are tens of millions of Americans who are already registered to vote, who list climate and the environment as their absolute number one priority. So why aren't they showing up in these polls of voters? Well, it's because environmentalists are really awful at voting. It turns out that the environmental movement has a turnout problem. There are tens of millions of us who do care about these issues, care about them so much that it's our top, top priority. The problem is we aren't showing up when it matters. We express ourselves in a whole host of ways that can be very impactful on our community and our society, but we ain't showing up on election day. And that is an enormous problem, but it's also an enormous opportunity. Before I get on to get into what is this problem, what is this opportunity, and how are we solving it, and how can you get involved, I just want to define this problem a bit for you. In the 2016 presidential election, 10.1 million already registered voters who list climate or the environment as their number one priority didn't vote. 10.1 million. They already are registered. They just sat at home on election day. They didn't walk out the door. 10.1 million in an election that was decided by 77,000 votes across three states. 
And as I'll get into a little bit later when I talk about how we and other sophisticated campaigns use data analytics to find these people, I, I can say in, 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 in the sort of the creepiest sense, we, we literally know who these people are by name and street address. I tell you there were 10.1 million environmentalists who did not vote in the 2016 presidential election, even though they were registered to vote. The last thing I'll say just about this problem, just so you can understand what I mean by this, this environmental voter turnout problem. Let's just look at the last three even year federal elections. So in the 2014 midterms, we had pretty low turnout, 83 million people voted. That represented about 44% of registered voters. Through our research, looking at voter files and building predictive models that I'll explain a little bit later, we were able to figure out that only 21% of environmentalists who are registered to vote and voted. So 44% of all registered voters in America voted in 2014, but only 21% of environmentalists who are registered showed up. 2016, it was a better situation and also in all presidential elections turned out as much higher than in midterms. So in 2016, 69% of registered voters, so I'm talking about registered rather than eligible for a whole bunch of reasons, but 69% of registered voters voted and 50% of environmentalists did. So a little bit better, but still way, way lagging behind the national average. 2018 got a lot better. First of all, it's important to understand that the 2018 midterms just this past November were the highest turnout rate of any midterm election in American history since 1914. 1914, this was a midterm election that took place three or four months after World War I, the war to end all wars broke out. So literally, I mean, like the world was falling apart and everybody was really, really uh, aware of the importance of civic engagement and voting. That was the last time we had a midterm election with as, as high turnout as we just did in 2018. 57% of registered voters showed up to vote. 53% of environmentalists did. Hey, hey, we're doing a lot, lot better. But still, look at that. We're still not even close to average. We're still not even at average. We can't pat ourselves on the back when we in the climate movement, who are so engaged and so deeply aware of huge existential threats, aren't even voting at the level of the average American. And believe me, you don't have time to get into a lot of data comparing to other issue constituency groups, but if you care about some other issue, if you care about gun rights, if you care about gun rights in the United States of America, you vote like it's your job. You never miss an election. You're turning out at 75, 80, 85 percent for these midterm elections. And the environmental movement can't even get up to average. We are leaving an enormous amount of our political power on the table because of this turnout problem an enormous amount of political power. But the good news, the good news is this. We live in a moment in time where it is almost impossible to change people's minds and to change people's opinions. But changing their behavior, it's a heck of a lot easier. And so the fact that there are tens of millions of environmentalists who are already registered to vote yet they're just not showing up on election day. Yeah, it's frustrating. I get it, believe me. But it's also a solvable problem. And it's an enormous amount of political power just sitting on the bench at the side of the field there and we just need to get them in the game. This is a huge, huge opportunity. And it's something that I really, really look forward to exploring with you for the rest of this presentation and then during the Q&A session. So now we're gonna get into how do we at the Environmental Voter Project identify these non-voting environmentalists? And then how do we get them to vote? And my hope is not only will this tell you something interesting about the work that we're doing, that if you'd like, you can get involved with, but it will also teach you uh, a lot about how sophisticated campaigns that are going on right now for people running for Senate and governor and president, how they individually identify voters and how they mobilize people to vote.
So how do we do this? At the Environmental Voter Project, we essentially just do three things. One, we identify these non-voting environmentalists using big data and predictive modeling, and I'll get into that. Not in a very deep way, because that's for the Q&A if you're interested, but, I, but I, will, I will get into it. We then leverage the latest behavioral science to mobilize these people to vote. And then third, and perhaps most importantly, we are not an election winning organization. We are an electorate changing organization. And so we don't just sit around on our hands waiting for a big sexy election to come every two years. Instead, we go into states, we find all the non-voting environmentalists, and whenever they have an election, whether it's for president or city council or library trustee or anything in between, we use it as a behavioral intervention opportunity to change these people's habits. And so when I say, when you see habit reinforcement on this slide, that's what that means. We stay with these people every single time they have an election, local, state, federal, primary, general, special, whenever they have an election, we are trying to turn them into better voters because that's the only way we will truly change their habits. And it's also extraordinarily important for changing local and state policy making as well because local officials and state officials also read polls and they also only care about people who show up to vote. And mayors and city councilors are going to concentrate on potholes in public schools until climate voters start showing up. And that's not to say that they shouldn't focus on potholes in public schools. But when millions and millions of climate voters stay at home and don't vote for their local elections, you shouldn't be surprised when mayors aren't out front leading on our issues. We need to show up. All right. So how do we do this? First, and please, I, I almost hesitate to give the, to throw this slide up here because there's a lot of information. So don't bother like crossing your eyes trying to read all of this stuff. But first, how do we identify these non-voting environmentalists? It comes back yet again to what I said you cannot forget, and that is whether you vote or not is public record. These public voter files are the most underappreciated aspect of all modern politics and policymaking. Everything, every policymaking decision can pretty much be traced back to an analysis of voter files. Politicians know who votes and who doesn't vote, and they only care about the people who vote, and all policymaking flows from that. Up until about eight or nine years ago, the only data that politicians had to go on when they were targeting people in campaigns was the basic demographic data on these voter files. So if I was running Terry's campaign for governor of Connecticut, I'd go to uh, her town hall or city hall and I'd go to some other town halls and city halls and I would see, okay, here are all the people of a particular gender and a particular ethnicity and a particular age and party affiliation, but there wasn't what much more that you could glean from these voter files. That's why in 2004, if any of you remember the, the Kerry Bush presidential campaign, people were talking about uh, soccer moms as being the swing voters. Well, these presidential campaigns didn't have lists of women who signed their children up for soccer leagues. No, just the only data they had was basic demographic data and they saw in their polling that suburban women weren't making up their minds yet. Well, now things have completely changed. Now, not to get like too creepy, we literally know who the soccer moms are. Big data has, has killed the soccer mom. Big data has killed this, this idea of targeting by demographic groups. Because starting about seven or eight years ago, a few companies on the progressive side and a few companies on the conservative side started buying up all of this behavioral and consumer data that's out there. And this is nothing like what you may have heard about Cambridge Analytica a few years ago, who was stealing data and was going online and pretending to be academics and tricking people to give them their data. No, this is stuff that people freely give up when they sign up for a credit card at the Gap or, or they, you 
scroll to the bottom of a 30 page contract to download an iTunes song or something like that. You, you, you might not know it always, unfortunately, but you're saying, oh yeah, uh, this organization can sell my data. And these companies buy this data and they merge it with their own proprietary versions of the voter file. And that gives them a really, really rich understanding of who every single voter is in that voter file. Now these versions of the voter file, these data rich versions of the voter file are not publicly available. They're proprietary to these companies. I don't even have access to them. We don't want access to them. But the fact that they exist gives us the opportunity, the, the ability to run really sophisticated experiments with data scientists to try to isolate certain types of people. And so what we do at the Environmental Voter Project is called predictive modeling. And it's something that a lot of data scientists do. And very quickly, this is an example of something that I'm going to give you sort of the three or four or five minute version of rather than the 20 minute version of, because if you're interested in going a little deeper, we can discuss it in the Q&A session. Very quickly, what predictive modeling is, and by the way, this is how both of the current presidential campaigns and most of the sophisticated US Senate campaigns are targeting voters right now. It starts with a survey, a poll, but unlike your typical political poll, instead of polling five or six or 700 people, we will poll 10,000 or 15,000 or 20,000 people per state. Enormous polls. And not just any 20,000 people, but 20,000 people off one of these data rich voter files. And we'll only ask them one question. Well, actually two questions. The first is we wanna make sure we get the right person on the phone. Is this Bob Smith Sr. or Bob Smith Jr.? Or uh, we don't just call people, we text them, we get them on online panels, we have a lot of ways to get in touch with them. And then the second question is very simple. We just ask them, what's your number one most important political priority out of this list of 10 issues? And then we just keep on asking that question over and over and over and over again until we get 10, 15, 20,000 responses, a huge amount of data. And then it's pretty easy for data scientists to start sifting through all those answers. And they can say, oh, look, there are about 1,500 people who listed climate change or clean air or clean water or environmental justice or, or some environmental issue as their number one priority. Hmm, and we have all this other consumer and behavioral data about those people. I wonder if we can find some hidden patterns and correlations. And they start digging through the data and sure enough, they're usually able to start identifying things. This is a, 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 a combination of data points that we found from various states. So don't, don't, this is, I'm using this data as an example. Don't, don't take it and run with it. You might find, oh, people who are forestry employees have an 11, you know, percent higher likelihood than average or 11 times as likely to list climate as, as their top priority. Ooh, people who've ditched their landline and now only have a cell phone are nine times as likely. Uh, Latino and Latina voters are seven, seven times likelier than the, than the normal voter, average voter in this state. They find all these like interesting data points. And it's really important to understand that no single variable is predictive on its own. But when you start combining groups of data points, it can be enormously powerful. These data scientists can look at the, the responses, the 20,000 responses from your surveys and compare them to all this consumer and behavioral data and demographic data and they could say, wow, you know, if we look at all these combinations, I mean, if you're a, if you are uh, living in the New Haven suburbs and are between the ages of 50 and 65 and have at least two degrees and bought a Volvo between eight and 10 years ago and shop at the Gap and subscribe to National Geographic, you've got like a 93% likelihood of listing climate as your top priority. And they start finding these little, these little hidden patterns like that. And then the end result is they assign a score from zero to 100 to every single person in a state voter file. What you're looking at right here is the distribution for the state of Florida. 
where we've been able to assign a score from zero to 100 to every single voter in the Florida voter file. The average voter in Florida, I think only has a 13 or 14% likelihood of listing climate or the environment as their top priority. But as you'll see, there are millions who are four times as likely as that average Floridian to list climate or the environment as their top priority. And again, we're assigning these scores to individuals and it's based off all of this data and this huge survey that we did. And the data scientists have a really iterative process where they just test and test these scores until they're really, really confident that it's accurate. And I've got to tell you, these scores are frighteningly precise. Whenever we build these models, our last step, once we isolate all these high scores, all these people who care so deeply about our issue, that, they, that we're confident they have a super high likelihood of listing climate or the environment as their top priority. Our last step is we, we send that list out to a different group of data scientists, a different pollster. And we say, can you check this other group's work? Can you just call these people and ask them off the top of their head what their number one issue priority is? The worst score we've ever gotten with that, the worst score was that off the top of their heads, 89% of respondents freely offered, oh yeah, climate change or the environment as their number one priority, 89%. I know this is a convoluted process. I'm happy to answer more questions about it in the Q&A, but I just wanna put a button on it by saying this. As complicated as this sounds, I think it's probably easier to understand by making an analogy to something that we all probably have more experience with, and that's insurance products. Chances are many of you have bought life insurance before. And when you buy life insurance, there's a very long application process where you need to give them data. You need to tell them how old you are. You need to tell them your medical history. You tell them how, what you eat and how much you drink and how much you smoke and how much you exercise and whether you like to do crazy stuff like jump off cliffs and things like that. And they take all this data and they essentially do what we did. They build a predictive model. They compare all of your, your data profile to millions of other data profiles, and they don't call it a predictive model, they call it an actuarial table, and it's slightly different, it's not exactly the same, but it's, it's largely the same. And they, not to get morbid, they need to predict how long you're gonna live. And if they're off even by a little bit, like the global economy fails, Insurance companies have gotten really good at this. If they can't pretty accurately predict how long you're going to live, they lose money off you. And if they do that over and over and over again, they lose billions, even trillions of dollars. Well, we at the Environmental Voter Project are essentially using the same approach, but we're not trying to predict how long everybody's going to live in the state of Florida or the state of Arizona. We're trying to figure out how likely every single person is in that state to not just care about climate or the environment, but listed as their number one issue priority over all other issues. And I'll get into it more during the Q&A if you're interested. This is how every presidential campaign right now is targeting voters. This is how every US Senate campaign right now is targeting voters. They've assigned scores to every single one of you if you're registered to vote, individualized scores telling them how likely you are to support Donald Trump, how likely you are to support Joe Biden, how likely you are to vote on election day. And it's frighteningly accurate. It's frighteningly accurate. What this allows us to do, this is an enormous opportunity for the environmental movement. What this allows us to do is isolate all these people who we don't know for sure, but we have a, a very high, high likelihood of, of getting these people who list climate as their number one priority. And then you don't need to be a data scientist to just figure out which of them vote and which of them don't vote. Remember, that's public record. So we isolate these non-voting environmentalists and we're literally able to find them by name and street address. These are the 2,434 registered voters in Portland, Maine who list climate or the environment as their top priority who didn't vote in 2016. We can send canvassers to their door. We have cell phone numbers to text most of them. We can call them on the phone. We can send them direct mail and digital advertisements. These are the 42,000 in Philadelphia. 
These are the 42,000 in Phoenix, Arizona. We literally know where they are. We know where they are. And as I mentioned before, this is of crucial importance to the environmental movement in particular, because we don't have a persuasion problem. We don't need to change minds. We need to change behavior. So being able to individually identify these non-voting environmentalists is an extraordinary opportunity for us. Okay, that gets to the third thing that I want to discuss. Once we find these people, once we identify these non-voting environmentalists, how do we get them to vote? Well, the Environmental Voter Project, but also we, the environmental movement writ large, should be taking advantage of these opportunities. We have over 3,500 volunteers around the country who are helping us whenever there's an election, local, state, or federal, contact these voters and turn them into better voters. We are like this full-time field campaign, just finding these people and mobilizing them to vote. When there's not a, a pandemic, we do door-to-door -door canvassing. We do phone calls. We do text messages. We do direct mail. We do digital outreach. As a reminder, we never endorse any candidates. We couldn't do that because of our, our IRS status, but also it turns out that's a pretty awful way to, to get non-voters to start voting, and I can, I can get into some of the behavioral science behind that. But also, politicians want to win elections. It's maybe the last thing that unites Democrats and Republicans these days. Nothing motivates a politician more than the prospect of winning or losing an election. So we know it, it, endorsements in many ways aren't that powerful because politicians are always just going to go where the votes are. They're going to go where the votes are. And so we need to just make more environmental voters. You make more environmental voters, politicians will react. They're either going to go to the, where the votes are, or they're not going to get to be a politician anymore. I know that sounds cynical, but it's just, it's the basic arithmetic of how elections work. You go where the votes are, or you don't win. And so we all we do is whenever there's an election, we don't bother endorsing people. We just focus on the voters. We canvass, we call, we text, we mail, we send digital ads to these people we've individually identified as non-voting environmentalists. And then here I think is the really interesting part, the behavioral science we use. Because we're so confident that we're identifying people who don't need any issue education, they don't need any persuasion, they don't need their minds or opinions changed, we get to bypass the most difficult and expensive part of politics and communication. And we can just move right to behavior change, which is much, much easier and cheaper than changing people's minds and opinions. And again, I'm happy to go into more detail in the Q&A if you're interested, but very briefly, the Environmental Voter Project has discovered by running close to 200 randomized control trials, we're always experimenting with different messages to see how they change voter turnout. We've discovered that talking about the environment is a pretty awful way to get environmentalists to vote. In fact, behavioral scientists, whether you be psychologists or economists or sociologists, are coming to realize that rationally trying to convince anybody to take a particular action almost always fails. It turns out, and again, I'm, I'm happy to get into some of the experiments if you're interested in, in drilling down more into this. It turns out when we are deciding to act consciously or subconsciously, most of us are not rational beings making cost benefit analyses. Most of us aren't treating every potential action or behavior as though it's a transaction. And we're trying to figure out, oh, if I do this, will I get a, a return on the, on the amount of effort that I put in? Instead, what most behavioral scientists have come to realize is that people are expressive beings. We are societal beings far more than we are rational beings. We are people who build personalities for ourselves. And most of our behavioral choices have far more to do with how we view ourselves and how we want others to view us. This is what behavioral psychologists call expressive choice theory. 
as opposed to rational choice theory. The idea being, when we decide to take an action, whether we're aware of this or not, we are expressing an, an important aspect of our personality. So what that often means is instead of us trying to rationally convince an environmentalist to vote because they care about climate change and they've really got to show up for X or Y election, instead we're trying to figure out, okay, who are these people? And more importantly, how do they want to be seen? How do they want outsiders to view them? Maybe many of you have volunteered for political campaigns before where you've asked people to sign a promise to vote, a pledge to vote. That's based on expressive choice theory. The idea behind getting voter pledges is that one of the strongest societal norms, not only in the United States, but in pretty much any culture, is that people want to be thought of as honest and trustworthy. Unless you're a sociopath, like you don't want to be thought of as a liar. You don't want people to think of you as a liar. It's a really strong, pervasive, cross-cultural societal norm. And so one of the best ways to get somebody to vote is to get them to promise to vote. And then most importantly, you can follow up with them after the fact and you can say, hey, Terry, I just want to remind you, way back in June, you made a promise to vote and Tuesday's the election. And I know it's important to you to keep your promises. And so Tuesday's your opportunity to follow through on your promise. All of a sudden, instead of me having a conversation with Terry, about the potential value of her one vote in an election of millions, we've moved into a far more normative framework where the act of voting is going to reveal whether Terry's a liar or not, which is a little aggressive, but holy moly, does it work? Holy moly, does it work? What are some other norms? Well, basic peer pressure. Our volunteers will often send text messages to voters saying things like, Hey, did you know last time there was an, a city council election, 83 people on your block of Main Street turned out to vote? Just basic peer pressure. But it works. It sends turnout through the roof. It increases turnout two, three, four percentage points over the control group. And if those numbers don't sound like a lot to you, ask Hillary Clinton. 3% is everything in this business. But it turns out we, we never left the fourth grade playground. Peer pressure means a lot to us. Human beings are, I don't even want to say social animals, we are societal animals. We build huge ethical structures. Heck, I'm, I'm talking to the like Connecticut IPL affiliate, to the, the Interreligious Eco Justice Network. You know about these huge cross-cultural, cross-language, cross-national ethical frameworks that we build for ourselves. This is so unique among any of the animals on earth. I mean, far more unique than opposable thumbs. This is what makes us human, that we set up these huge societal norms that people adhere to in really, really sticky ways. We even go so far, and this is about as aggressive as we get, we even go so far as to mail people copies of their personal voting histories. Because in other experiments that we've won, run, we've realized that even people who don't vote, even really, really awful voters, still buy into the societal norm that voting is a good thing. They don't want to be thought of as an awful voter. They want to be thought of as a good voter. And so if we send them a letter letting them know that whether they vote or not is public record, and hey, by the way, buddy, here are all the elections that you just missed, it sends turnout again through the roof through the roof. And you might notice, we don't talk about the environment on here, except to sign our names at the bottom because we don't want to be seen as some like dark secret organization. So this is the behavioral science that not only we use, but a lot of political campaigns are now using to try to change people's behavior, to get them to register to vote, to get them to volunteer, to get them to donate, and most importantly, to get them to show up on election day. It's far less about trying to rationally convince you to take a particular action than it is about figuring out, okay, who are these people? Who do they want to be? How do they want to be viewed? And can we use that to get them to take this action? And I know that that sounds manipulative, but it's only manipulative because we have, we have 
made it seem like rationally convincing someone to do something is appropriate, whereas using the fact that we are societal animals to get them to do something is inappropriate. But that's silly. I, I, I mean, we, we are societal animals. And the truth is, we're trying to manipulate people when we rationally have a conversation with them too. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So why not do the stuff that does work? That's what we do with the Environmental Voter Project. We use these data analytics to individually identify these environmentalists who aren't voting. And then we leverage these behavioral science tools to not just get them to vote in these big sexy elections like the upcoming presidential, but every election, local, state, and federal. Because as I don't need to explain to any of you, we are living through truly dark, scary times. And if we have tens of millions of non-voting environmentalists out there who we can find and leverage these techniques to turn into better, more consistent voters, you're darn right we're going to use these tools to do it. You're darn right we are. All right, we've got 10 minutes left until we get into q and I just want to illustrate for you how powerful some of these tools can be. In the 2018 midterm elections, about a year and a half after we launched, we ended up contacting 2.1 million voters across six states. We submitted our work to randomized control trials. I can get into what that means in the Q&A if you're interested. And we were able to prove that we were solely responsible while controlling for all outside variables and other organizations getting involved. We were solely responsible for increasing turnout 2.7 percentage points over our control group in those six states. That was good enough for adding almost 59,000 brand new environmental voters into the 2018 midterm in those six states. We also graduated 93,000 voters. What do I mean by graduated? I mean, these were people who just in our first year and a half, two years, who we were contacting because they were people who missed most of their elections. They didn't vote in local, state, federal elections. And by the end of 2018, 93,000 of these people we were contacting had voted in local, state, and federal elections. They were such super voters that even if you were running for library trustee, you would say, oh yeah, this person's gonna vote. And you would poll them to figure out what issues they cared, out, cared about, and that would drive policymaking. We graduated 93,000 of them outside of our program because they were such super voters, we didn't have any work left to do. Campaigns would take over, campaigns would target them, policymakers would target them, which is our ultimate goal. Last year in 2019, we expanded from our original six states, and I can get into why we're in these states if you're interested in the Q&A. We expanded from our additional six states, uh, or, or rather our original six states into an additional six states. So starting last fall in September, we are working in these 12 states. We are still working in these 12 states. And last year, remember what I said, we, we really focus a lot on habit reinforcement. And so even though 2019 wasn't a big election year for most people, in these 12 states, there were 613 local and state elections where we contacted these voters, 613. Because if you truly care about changing people's habits, you can't just talk to them every two or four years when there's a big election. How would that work if you were trying to lose weight? How would that work if you were trying to exercise more often? You can't change someone's habits by having them do something new just once every two years. And so we used all of these elections as opportunities to leverage these cutting edge behavioral science techniques to turn these people into better voters, whether they were voting for city council or state rep or a primary or a general or for governor. This is how many people we contacted in 2019. We partnered with a whole bunch of organizations and we were able to increase turnout in some elections as much as 4.1 percentage points. Now, I don't want to mislead you. It's a little bit easier, not even a little bit. It's a lot easier, to be honest, to increase turnout in off years like 2019 than it is in 2018 and 2020. But once again, we, we had really great results with our randomized control trials. And most importantly, by the end of last year, we had graduated over 250,000 people out of our program in these original six states. 
We didn't have any graduates in our expansion states yet because we had only been there for a few months by the end of last year. Over 25,000 graduates. We graduated 50,929 people in Pennsylvania, a state where the presidential election was only decided by 44,000 votes in 2016. These are really, really big numbers. Finally, what have we been doing since then? Well, again, every election is an opportunity to talk to people and turn them in, turn, talk to environmentalists and turn them into better voters. As you'll see, these numbers change depending on the election cycle. We only target environmentalists who are unlikely to vote, unlikely to vote. And as you probably know, there are some people who are likely to vote in a presidential election, yet they are unlikely to vote in say like a summer primary. And so you'll see this winter and spring for presidential primaries, we were targeting about 4 million unlikely to vote environmentalists in our 12 states. That number is now expanding as we're targeting people for their state primaries. But then it will shrink again this fall because there are a whole bunch of people who are unlikely to vote in this summer's elections, but likely to vote in a presidential general. And again, we don't like to duplicate other organizations' efforts. We're not gonna mobilize someone to vote if we think there's a really high likelihood of them voting anyway. Those people don't need our work. They need to make sure they're voting for the right person and other groups do that. So even this fall, we will be targeting 2.5 million unlikely to vote environmentalists, who to be clear, are already registered. They're already registered to vote. They've just never voted in a presidential election before. All right, we're coming to the close here. What are some ways that you can either get involved in our, in our work or use some of these learnings just in your everyday life as you're trying to be a good environmental activist and hopefully a, a civically engaged one as well. Well, the first thing is pledge to vote. Uh, the Environmental Voter Project is actually partnering with Interfaith Power and Light. If you go to the IPL, the National IPL website, interfaithpowerandlight.org and then slash voter dash pledge dash form, you will see an online voter pledge where you can sign up and promise to vote. And even if you're not in one of our 12 states, in all 50 states, we will follow up with you and send you email reminders whenever you have an election, local, state, or federal, always using language that we know from our studies is most likely to get you to vote. I am sure I'm preaching to the choir here. I'm sure you guys never miss an election but maybe your kids need a reminder, maybe someone else needs a reminder, who knows? But this is a, a really, really good, easy opportunity in a completely apolitical, nonpartisan way for people who care about the environment to make sure that they never miss an election. And especially now during COVID-19, we'll send you other useful information. Here is how you can apply for an absentee ballot. Here's when early voting is, things like that. The second thing, Certainly, if you want to volunteer with us, every single day, we are contacting 20, 25, sometimes 30,000 of these non-voting environmentalists. We have over 3,500 volunteers around the country who text and call these voters for us. If you go to our website, environmentalvoter.org, you can go to the Get Involved tab and you can sign up to volunteer and you'll immediately get emailed a link to a whole bunch of already scheduled online training webinars where one of our organizers will teach you what we're about and how you can text or call these non-voting environmentalists from the comfort of your own home. And you won't have to do any really awkward stuff. It's not like you're trying to browbeat them to support candidate X or candidate Y. Usually you're just asking people, do you intend to vote? You're like closing that trap on them. Because if they tell you you're gonna vote, that allows us to come back right before the election and say, hey, you promised that you were going to vote, which we know is a really, really powerful drive to getting them to change their behavior. Another thing we're doing right now is we're calling and texting into Florida, Arizona, and Pennsylvania, three states where they have opt-in vote-by-mail programs, where people can't automatically get a ballot mailed to them, but if they opt into the system, they can get it mailed to them which for obvious reasons is extraordinarily important these days. And again, we literally know who these non-voting environmentalists are. We know them, we have their phone numbers, and we would love to have your help contacting these people. And you can just do it while sitting on the couch watching TV. 
The third thing is this. What we know from now decades of behavioral, behavioral science experiments is that some of the greatest power you have to affect change in the community is how people view you and how they take societal cues from you. It has much to do with that expressive choice theory stuff that I was talking about. And so as we're approaching an extraordinarily important election, I would suggest to all of you, it is enormously important that you not just vote, but that you be loud and proud about the fact that you are a voter. Don't hide your light under a bushel. You are at your most powerful when people are looking at you and they see on social media or they see in your congregations or they see over Zoom, oh, so-and-so is talking about being a voter. So-and-so is voting. It's how people make these normative connections. They say, oh, well, I'm a good member of that community. Maybe I ought to be a voter too, or I'm a member of that congregation. Maybe voting is very important to people of that congregation. People take these societal cues extraordinarily seriously. And so I encourage you, at the very least, don't just vote, but make it very clear that voting is, is an important part of who you are as an environmentalist. It is an important part of who you are as a member of your faith community. It is part of who you are as a person. That will have power. That will get more people to vote, far more even than you calling up all your neighbors and trying to rationally convince them to vote. This is what will do it. I'm going to close by saying this. Please, 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 under no circumstances, walk away from tonight's discussion feeling frustrated or upset. Don't say, oh, this like Nathaniel guy told me that environmentalists don't vote and this is awful and like everything's going to be ruined. No, no, this is not bad news. Yes, it's frustrating, but I suggest to you this is good news. Changing habits is so much easier than changing minds. Changing behavior is so much easier than changing opinions. This is a huge opportunity for the climate movement. A huge opportunity. You know what would be bad news? What would be bad news is if I said, hey, we've done all this polling and it turns out nobody cares about climate change. That would, would suck. That would be really, really bad news because changing those people's minds would be darn near impossible. But that's not where we are. It turns out there are tens of millions of already registered to vote, died in the wool environmentalists, and we can find them. And we know how to dramatically increase their likelihood of voting, not just on an election by election basis, but over time in really, really dramatic ways. So this is an enormous opportunity. And the second thing, and the final thing I'll say to you is, not only will this have a really important impact on who gets elected. It will absolutely change policymaking. Because believe me, as all of us are sitting here on this Zoom call right now, there are probably a hundred polls in the field around the country. A hundred, not exaggerating. But they are not polling all Americans. These politicians are not even polling all registered voters. They are only polling people whose public voting histories tell them they are likely to show up for this November's presidential election. Those are the first class citizens. Those are the people whose opinions drive policymaking. And so it is of crucial importance that we in the environmental movement make sure that as many of us as possible are in that group of voters because politicians don't care about the non-voters. They only care about the voters. And those are the people who drive policymaking. And here's the best part. We drive policymaking every single day. Because the truth is, policy ain't made on election day. In fact, election day is like the only day of the year where no laws are made, no policy is made. No, policy is made in the intervening weeks and months and years. And what drives policymaking then is polls of likely voters. 
And I would suggest to you that if we all woke up tomorrow morning and the front page of the New York Times said that likely voters in the upcoming election list climate change as their number two priority, the whole world would change. The whole world would change. Because nothing motivates a politician more than the prospect of winning or losing an election. Nothing. So I'll leave you with this. We've got 102 days until early voting starts. 102 days. Imagine yourself 102 days from now sitting down to watch election returns roll in. Do a favor to that future version of yourself and don't have any regrets. Don't have any regrets. We're never going to get this time back. And whether you pledge to vote, whether you volunteer for us, whether you volunteer for other organizations or campaigns, or whether you just be a loud and proud environmental voter in your faith community, please do something because I guarantee you, you do not want to have any regrets 102 or 143 days from now when the actual election happens. So that's all I've got. Sorry, I went four minutes over, Terry. I'm really, really excited for a great, great Q&A session. Well, that was awesome. Hang on a second, let me, all right. That was great. I actually feel so hopeful right now. I feel so optimistic. I'm also looking forward to my run for governor and awesome. I promise you that I will vote. You will not, I will not be a liar. Um, okay. But no, that was, that was so great. And honestly, I really do feel so optimistic. And for those of you tuning into this webinar, I really, I ask you, I urge you to get involved you know, this is the time that we have to make this difference. I was, I'm just, un, like just gobsmacked that 10.1 million environmentalists registered voters didn't vote. And I'm so excited by how much the Environmental Voter Project has turned that around. So I urge you to get involved. So we're gonna take questions through the Q&A and the chat function. So I'm gonna go and see what we got here on, okay, some questions coming in. Why is that so large? Okay, here we go. How much, how much impact does the age demographics of environmental voters impact the overall situation? I.e., are many reliable environmental voters young people, maybe even first-time voters, and the age-old problem is that of getting young people to the polls? Great. Oh, oh, you know, that was it. Okay. Yep. Great, great question. So, uh, a little bit, a little bit, but let me get a bit more nuanced than that because we have a lot of data about this. First thing to understand is uh, everything that I'm about to say is within the framework of our very idiosyncratic definition of what an environmentalist is. Obviously, there are a million and one ways to define an environmentalist. We at the Environmental Voter Project, because we don't want to waste time on the hard stuff of, of issue education and persuasion, we, we have a very high bar. We go after the tip of the spear. Uh, and we're only going after people who care so deeply about these issues that climate and the environment is their number one priority. So who are those people? Uh, they are more likely to make less than $50,000 a year than more. They uh, are more likely to be people of color. So African-Americans, Latinx, and Asian-Americans are overrepresented in this population. And yes, by and large, they are younger rather than older. So the first thing to say is, clearly that's part of what's going on here. Part of why environmentalists don't vote as often as the average American is some basic demographic correlations. Those three groups that I just mentioned to you, poor people, young people, and people of color, vote less often than average Americans. But here's the really interesting thing, the really interesting thing. That's only part of what's going on here. Because when we drill down more, if we only look at young people, 18 to 24, let's say, the environmentalists vote less often than other young people. If we only look at African-Americans, the environmentalists vote less often than other African-Americans. If we only look at poor people, the environmentalists vote less often than other poor people. So, so the, per, the, the question is a very shrewd one. And yes, part of what's going on here is some, very, is some demographic correlations, but that's only part of it. The final thing I'll say is, uh, at least in the way that we identify environmentalists, which again is a very idiosyncratic definition. There's a lot of nuance there when you look at the age demographic breakdowns. Yeah, by and large on the top line data, young people are more likely than old people to list climate or the environment as the top priority, but there's some really interesting uh, 
nuance there. For instance, 18 to 24 year olds are actually less likely than 25 to 34 year olds to fit our criteria. So if you're really young, you're a little less likely to list climate as your top priority than people in their late 20s and early 30s are. Another really interesting thing that we're seeing is that women in their 60s and 70s are now, uh, I don't wanna say through the roof, but far, far more likely than middle-aged people or men in their 60s and 70s to care deeply about climate or the environment. Mm. It's something that we, we, we it's like an, a gender gap that increases with age. If hmm. you look at people who are really young, women are only three or four percentage points more likely than men to list climate or the environment as their top priority. But the older you get, the wider that gender gap gets, such that when you look at people in their 60s and 70s, women are sometimes 25, 30, 35 percentage points more likely to list climate or the environment as their top priority than men are. Huh, that is fascinating. Do we know why that gap widens? That we don't know. We don't. It's one of the hardest things in any social science to determine is, is why are we seeing this? Uh, yeah, because, yeah, of course. Because you can when see you what ask you're people, seeing, right. Yeah, because when you ask people, it, it, there are a lot of response biases and things like that. I can tell you this, we, we jokingly refer to it as the grandmother effect. We have mm -hmm. no idea if that has anything to do with it, but uh, it, it, is, it, it truly is shocking. Uh, mm. th because th there's just this, in every single one of our states, there's this, this gender gap that grows with age. That is fascinating. So Jessica says, appreciate your presentation. Her question is this, given the existence of the pandemic and the likely necessity of voting via mail, what are your thoughts about navigating this, given that the current administration will do what it can to suppress progressive voters? Uh, voting by mail is of crucial crucial importance, Jessica. Like, absolutely. What we at the Environmental Voter Project have already started doing is we are calling and texting our target voters, so these non-voting environmentalists, in these states where you can opt in to vote by mail. So Pennsylvania, Arizona, Florida, states like that, Maine. Uh, because, well, we're doing it for a few reasons. One, we are very worried about people's ability to vote on election day. I mean, right now there's an election going on in Georgia where people are having to wait in line for four hours, like right now as we speak. And we want to avoid that. Second, just for health reasons, you want, I mean, just like you want to flatten the curve for COVID-19, well, you want to flatten the curve on election day. The idea is instead of having 95% of people cast their ballots in person on election day, you want to have 50% cast them by mail and 40% do in-person early voting so that on election day, only 10% of the people who are voting are showing up. And that means there are fewer people, there's a, le you know, a lower health risk, things like that. Now, you, you alluded to uh, uh, political fights where people are trying to say bad things about vote by mail. And that's certainly a struggle. But... Uh, if I can read between the lines uh, to your question, I, I think you're seeing through some of the rhetoric, Jessica, <laughs> as well as you should be. But it's important to make sure that everybody knows that voting by mail is safe, it is secure, and not for nothing, it ain't just Democrats who are trying to get people to vote by mail, Republicans are too. Regardless of what the president is saying in his press conferences, I mean, the Republican Party is texting people in Pennsylvania every single day saying, hey, there's this opt-in vote by mail program. Make sure that you sign up to vote by mail. Uh, so, so lots of people are going to be doing it. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us in our everyday life to make sure that people feel comfortable with it. Uh, because there is going to be a lot of misinformation and it's going to be extraordinarily important. Great. Kimberly is wondering, how, please explain how you determine which states to add and what states are next. Yeah, so let me uh, go back here. These are the 12 states that we are in. So we use the following criteria to decide what states to work in. First, and by far and away most important, 
is we go into states where there are huge populations of non-voting environmentalists. We need that. That is the, the, the by far and away most important precondition to doing our work. Because if we go into a state like Idaho, where there are only like 110 non-voting environmentalists, it doesn't matter how good we are. We could kill it every time there was an election. We could get the best results possible. And when your denominator is that small, you're just never gonna move the policy dial on the local, state, or federal level. So our, the most important thing for us is we go into states, which all of these 12 have in common, we go into states where there are huge, disproportionately large populations of these non-voting environmentalists so that we know if we hit them with these behavioral science informed messages every single time they've got an election, well, over the course of time, over one, two, three years, when the average American can have 12 or even 15 elections, we can really, really start changing the way the electorate looks. The second thing I'll mention, uh, we don't just care about federal policymaking. We care about local and state policymaking too. I'm not a policy wonk, but my, I, I hope that everybody in the climate movement is now painfully aware and, and the environmental movement even writ large of the important role that local and state policymakers play. I mean, big city mayors can save the planet with little tweaks to zoning codes and building regs and parking regulations and traffic laws. But again, they aren't going to lead on these issues if climate voters don't show up for their elections. Now, as for the next uh, states that we're gonna move into, Kimberly, uh, we probably are not going to add states over the next five months. However, our general approach will be to always look for states that have huge populations of these non-voting environmentalists. And we have, through our research, identified 21, 22 states that have these disproportionately large populations of non-voting environmentalists. I know many, if not all of you, are from Connecticut, and Connecticut is one of those states. It was not in the top 12. You guys don't have like, you know, an absurd number of non-voting environmentalists. So it didn't make sense for Connecticut to be sort of among the top 12, but it, it certainly makes sense for us. It just didn't make as much sense as some of these other states. That, uh, just off the top of your head, do you know what the number is in Connecticut of how many people were missing? I don't. And again, to be clear, the, the number varies from election to election. Right. Right. So, uh, for instance, in the 2018 midterm elections, 13.1 million environmentalists did not vote. So obviously the, the number of non-voters is bigger, the, the, the lower the turnout election is. Right. But I could look up our, the last time we, we researched that data and let you know how many already registered to vote environmentalists skipped, you know, the 2018 midterms and the 2016 presidential and, and all that data. Wow. Yeah. That would be, that'd be interesting to know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Peter says what you speak about sounds a lot like the idea as a political analyst. And I apologize. I'm probably going to, uh, mispronounce her name. Rachel Bitkoffer has promoted in the past few years, as I understand it, she believes that successful campaigning is more dependent upon bringing out your base rather than convincing swing voters to vote for you. I understand that this is considered somewhat revolutionary thinking in the political world. Is she using the same analytical tools as you do? So she is largely not using the same analytical tools that, that, that we do. And I want to be clear. Uh, I value her research and I, I think it is, uh, I don't disagree with it, but I also want to be clear about the difference between what we do at the Environmental Voter Project and what campaigns do. Our goal is not to win one-off elections and t talking to really bad voters is a pretty inefficient way to win a one-off election. Now that's not to say that Rachel's research is wrong. I think a lot of her research is enormously powerful, but it's one thing to apply it to campaigns and it's another thing to apply it to what we're doing. We do this, we just find the people who aren't voting and get them to vote because it is the most efficient way to build up political power in the environmental movement. But if I wasn't 
like wearing my nonprofit executive director hat. And instead of trying to build political power over two, three, four years in these states and just long term change the electorate, if instead I was running Terry's campaign for governor, well, the truth is, yeah, voter turnout is enormously powerful. And what I think a lot of Rachel's research and other people's research has highlighted is that it is much more powerful than people usually recognize. But is it everything? No, it is absolutely not. I guarantee you it isn't. In any of these swing states, and, and you should disbelieve any pundit who tries to suggest otherwise, in any of these swing states that anybody is focused on right now, all three legs of the stool have to happen. You're all going to have to do voter registration, voter turnout, and voter persuasion. You just can't get to your win numbers in these tight states without it. And most importantly, I think it's crucial to understand that really efficiently and really cheaply getting 45% of the vote doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If I'm running Terry's campaign for governor and I come up to her on election night and be like, hey, wow, it was really easy for us to get 45% of the vote. Like we almost spent no money. Wow, congratulations. Well, what the hell does she care? We lost. We lost. And so, yeah, there's a lot of research coming out now. Rachel's is some of it and other, other uh, professors and, and researchers have highlighted other stuff showing that simply focusing on voter turnout and using a lot of these behavioral science tools, you can pretty cheaply create new votes. But just because campaigns also do voter persuasion on top of that doesn't mean that they're wrong. Campaigns aren't trying to cheaply get to 45% of the vote. Campaigns aren't trying to do what the Environmental Voter Project is doing, which is really efficiently over a few years dramatically increase political power in the environmental movement in these states. No, campaigns are trying to get 50% plus one of the market share on one Tuesday in November. And if that last 3% or 4% that they need to get is really inefficient, well, they don't care. They don't care if it costs them $2,000 a vote to get the last 10,000 10, votes because all they care about is winning. So it's a very, very good question, but at least in the, in the political campaign space, it's far more nuanced, I think, than just figuring out what's better. Is it turnout or persuasion or, or registration? When the truth is it's a little bit of both. And especially in the campaign world, it's always important to understand that they care about winning far more than, than really efficiently getting part of the way there. But it's a great question. Uh, awesome. Thank you. thank you for that answer. So Art um, says, first, thank you for sharing your expertise. It's fascinating. Second, the big data component is pretty creepy. And his question is, and I think we definitely agree with that, a uh, yep. question, racial and social economic justice is a big component of the future of the environmental movement, particularly in the context of the current protest movement. But I would speculate that this is a societal cross-section amongst the most poorly represented amongst likely voters. Would you offer approaches slash solutions on capitalizing on these two groundswell movements? So the first thing I'll, I'll say is it is really important, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, it's really important to understand that whatever perceptions or conception we had of an environmentalist 10, 15, 20 years ago is no longer the case. We're not talking about, well, we're not talking about me. We're not talking about like white yuppies wearing fleeces hopping out of their Priuses. Like this is a, 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 uh, a well, people of color, poor people and young people are disproportionately represented in this target community. And so when we are testing all of our messaging, it is always with that in mind. We are always trying to figure out what messaging works best with particular subgroups to get them to vote. And so the first thing I would say, Art, is that anybody in this space needs to view intersectionality as not just being a buzzword or a tactic. It is quite literally who we are. It isn't like we're trying to, to, to make allies 
the environmental movement is people of color. It is who we are. It is our constituency. And that is enormously important to understand. Mm. So th that is, is, I think, a, uh, the answer from just sort of a purely political and mobilization point of view. We need to understand that these are the environmental movement. People of color are the environmental movement. And we always need to test our messaging accordingly. Second, purely from a policy standpoint, and I, I rarely try to talk about policy because I'm not a policy guy, I'm a political guy, but I'm increasingly frustrated that this, this doesn't come up enough. I am tremendously thankful and grateful that there is now a lot of discussion about systemic and structural racism in the United States. But I still am frustrated that the environmental movement I think views environmental justice issues almost as a, as a tactic. When in reality, the fossil fuel industry depends upon systemic racism. It is enabled by systemic racism. I mean, at every point in the process, extracting fossil fuels, refining fossil fuels, transporting fossil fuels, burning them into electricity and heat, we create toxic air and toxic water. And there is no way we would still be living in a fossil fuel economy if that toxic air and toxic water was spread out evenly across society and people in the lily white suburbs had coal fired power plants in their backyard. It just wouldn't be happening. And so, in truth, the fossil fuel industry is enabled by this systemic racism. It allows it to thrive and survive because we as a society essentially permit an economy that poisons people of color. And I think it's so important that we recognize that as a policy matter and as a political matter because if these burdens were shared evenly, if systemic racism didn't prop up the fossil fuel industry, oh man, I mean, we'd be 20 years further down the line to a clean and green economy. And so I think to answer another part of your question, Art, that needs to be a part of our persuasion messaging and our organizing messaging and our advocacy messaging. I'm not a lobbyist, I'm not an advocate, I'm not an organizer, I'm not a persuasion communications person, but but I used to do that stuff in running political campaigns. And I find it enormously frustrating that the environmental movement isn't incorporating this, this aspect of systemic racism in our country into the environmental movement in what I think, uh, at least in the way it ought to be. That was a great answer. I mean, yeah, I, I was getting people saying, yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so I, I think we have time for two more questions. So. Uh, Judy said, many Bernie Sanders supporters did not vote in the 2016 presidential election. My speculation is that a lot of Bernie supporters are environmentalists. Is there evidence to bear this out? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, but not as, it, it's probably not as, dis, as disproportionate a distribution. How's that for being really academic? Let me put that a different way. Uh, <laughs> They aren't as overwhelmingly Bernie Sanders supporters as you might imagine. Uh, again, uh, think about some of the demographic data that I was mentioning. Uh, African Americans, Latinx, Asian American voters are far more likely to list climate or the environment as their top priority than Caucasians are. Yes, younger people care more about these issues than older people, but there's this big group of women in particular in their 60s and 70s who are now listing this as a top priority. So yes, when you look at the Democratic primary electorate, you know, last, last few months, and certainly the people who voted for Bernie Sanders in 2016, uh, but if you look at the Democratic primary electorate, more People who list climate as their top priority supported, supported Bernie Sanders than any other candidate. But you know who was second? Joe Biden. And Elizabeth Warren wasn't that far behind. And, and they weren't like way behind Bernie. They were pretty far up there. Um, as far as will they vote uh, in November? 
I think it's important to recognize two things. One, uh, Joe Biden is getting as much or more support from Bernie Sanders supporters than Hillary Clinton did. And two, going back to this expressive choice theory stuff that I discussed and sort of the, the behavioral science sort of scaffolding that I hope I gave you, a lot of people are just looking for a permission structure to vote for someone. I think it is highly unlikely that this general election will be centered on any policy issue. That's for primaries. Primaries are about like battles over policy nuances. That ain't gonna happen in a general election. But is there an opportunity for candidates at, in Senate races, in congressional races, and in the presidential races to say certain things and message in certain ways and have certain allies such that they create a permission structure for people who care about climate to say, okay, I feel okay casting a ballot for that person. Yeah, I think there's a tremendous amount of room for that. And I think you will see the Biden campaign doing a lot of that work, using allies, using Bernie Sanders, using AOC, but also coming out with a lot of policy proposals, trying to create that permission structure. I don't think anybody in the climate movement is gonna end up seeing Joe Biden with a, with a cape on his back, with a big like green C on it for climate or anything like that. Like he's, he's not gonna be the greatest climate hero ever, most likely. But are they gonna try to create that permission structure to, to get more votes? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, Kathy said, also, if people have not voted in two years in Florida, they are purged from the voting records. Um, do you look at purge lists and link them with how to re-register to vote? How do you handle that? Yes, we do. Although, to be honest, it's a really uh, low return endeavor. And so a lot of it depends on our budget. Like all nonprofits, we raise money from small donations and big donations. And some people are purged because they don't vote that frequently, like you just mentioned. Some people are purged because they actually have moved. And so this, if we try to get in touch with them, we actually can't. And so contact rates are really abysmal when, when you try to do this stuff. But yes, we do get in touch with people who have been purged. We also do something that actually has a, a much better impact on turnout. We contact people who we know are about to be purged. And we say, we've noticed that you haven't voted in like X number of elections. And the state of Georgia or state of Florida has a rule such that if you don't vote in the next election, or you don't reply to a census card when it's sent to you, you are at risk of being purged from the voter rolls. And not just our research, but other research from organizations and sort of the broader progressive ecosystem show that this is a really, really great technique. Uh, because again, even bad voters don't wanna be thought of as good voters. And if you present them with this information that like, one, we know you haven't been voting that much, and two, like you're about to be put on the bad boy list, it actually really does drive turnout. Uh, so the answer is yes, we do that sometimes. I wish we could do it more. It's largely budget dependent because it's really inefficient. Uh, but what we definitely do a lot of is contact these infrequent voters who we think are about to be purged. We do that quite often. So actually, can you take one more question? Absolutely. absolutely. Oh, okay, great, great, great. Um, let's see here. So wait, was there another one? Oh, do, uh, do you have a do you have an idea of who doesn't vote because they can't? They're working two jobs or caring for a loved one at home. Do you have any sense of those barriers? Yeah, so it's a great question, uh, and boy, is this a doozy for the last one. Uh, it's really hard, not only in this space but in any social science, you know, economics, psychology, sociology, political science to separate people's excuses for not voting from the causes of not voting. Because remember, even people who don't vote buy into the societal norm that voting is a good thing. Right. And one of the hardest things for any social scientist to do is to figure out why someone doesn't take an action. We're really good at, at, at setting up experiments to figure out how to get them to take an action 
But to do the opposite, to figure out why they don't vote or why they don't exercise or why they don't healthy, eat healthy is really hard. Really the only tool we have is to ask them. And when you ask people why they aren't doing something that society views as important or good, guess what? They lie their pants off. They lie their pants off. So it's a long way of me saying, yes, we do know that there are a lot of people who say that they don't vote because they are working two jobs or because of, you know, it's uh, hard to get, you know, help on election day or things like that. And I don't want to minimize those issues. But what I can tell you is people who do vote almost always experience those same issues at the same rate. So I want to be very clear here. I am not saying we should continue to make it really hard for people to vote. <laughs> I think we should make it as easy as possible for people to vote. We should always encourage vote by mail. We should always have early voting. I love the idea of experimenting with election day as a day off or, or you know, things like that. We should always make it easier for people to vote. However, what is not clear is that those are the reasons driving lower turnout among certain uh, types of people. It's not clear at all. Do I know that that's not the answer? No, but it is really, really muddy and unclear. Essentially, any turnout problem is a black box because all we can do is take people's word for why they're not voting. And people rarely give an honest answer when you ask them why they're not doing something that society views as important. So we kind of have to learn to live with the black box and instead focus on efforts, focus our efforts on what we do know works when it comes to getting them to vote. Uh, so I do just want to, in closing, because I know that was, that was the last question, just say, please, please, please take to heart what I said. Do not be frustrated by the fact that so many environmentalists aren't voting. Be invigorated by it. This is an enormous opportunity. There is just, it, huge wells of potential political power in the environmental movement. And to the extent you want to get involved mobilizing them, whether it be getting people to pledge to vote, whether it be going to our website at environmentalvoter.org and volunteering for us to contact these people, whether it be volunteering for other campaigns in your neighborhood, or just being loud and proud about this being an aspect of who you are as a member of your faith community or as an environmentalist, please, please do it because I know you know we're running out of time, but this is one of the best, easiest ways to dramatically increase our political power because politicians go where the votes are. They go where the votes are. I know that sounds cynical, but it's just the way it is. They go where the votes are or they don't get to be politicians anymore. And so if we dramatically increase the number of environmentalists who vote, we will, we will get the leadership that we want. We absolutely will. All right. So that is amazing. Thank you so much, Nathaniel, for being with us. So everyone on this call, this is being recorded. It will be on YouTube. I will upload it to IREJN's YouTube channel. I highly encourage you to share it with your friends if they weren't able to watch tonight. And I will also be sending out the links that are on this slide right now to the um, Faith Climate Voter uh, through IPL and also to an opportunity to get involved with Environmental Voter Project. I will be definitely volunteering before the election and i already texted my sister and told her she was also going to be doing that so <laughs> she's very excited um honestly this is something we can do COVID has changed a lot of our opportunities for reaching out to people but we can call and we can text and we can help get these environmentalists uh registered to vote so thank you so much thank you nathaniel uh and thank you everyone for for joining us tonight and um, yeah, I'll be following up with an email tomorrow. So thank you and have a great night. Good night, everybody.